Are you planning on taking additional market share? Yes, you want it short <laughs> answer. <laughs> and I'm very confident. <laughs> we have unique offers on very fast and promising priority markets. This is why, yes, of course, I want to gain market share. And of course, that's what we ambition to do, to grow faster than the market. Three times faster, to be precise. Over the next three years, the world's largest water company intends to grow by 6 to 10% a year, starting from 4.7 billion euros, which projects them to reach about 6 billion in water tech and new solutions by 2027, supported in that by five priority offers, including one they launched yesterday, and that should provide 1 billion euro a year all by itself by 2030. More to that in a minute. This announcement, made at yesterday's deep dive event Veolia held in Oroshlani, stays in line with Veolia's bold and aggressive goals and communication since the beginning of the year. Indeed, they had already announced six months ago how they intend to double their business in the US by 2030, thus growing growing along the trend of reshoring key industries such as semiconductors, pharmaceutical hubs and gigafactories. Let's bring them home. But while the previous deep dives had given a bit more of an overall vision of tomorrow's Veolia, the last one entirely focused on the water part of the Red Army. And I should maybe find a better nickname. Uh, yeah, 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 you should. Anyways, Veolia's growth trajectory should not stop by 2027 as the aim is to add 50% more revenue to their water tech and new solutions segment by 2030, which is considered consistent with a 7% compound annual growth rate from now on to the end of the decade. To achieve that level of revenue increase, Veolia counts on a bit of organic growth. It's not quantified, but I'll assume the boxes on the graph are kind of representative of what drives what. Then some selective M&A, they've also used terms like tuck in, bolt on or accretive. So I don't expect them to be the one to take over the supposedly for sale Dupont Water and its 1.5 billion water tech business. And then the five priority offers I already mentioned. So let's zoom in on those starting from the largest one in figures impact, micropollutants. But let's be honest on what it mostly is, it's PFAS removal. What Veolia calls PFAS and new pollutants treatments, so also including endocrine disruptors or microplastics removal, started from zero in 2019, which is, I guess, a matter of definition, as I myself sold micropollutant removal projects for what's now Veolia for a couple of millions a year in the first half of the last decade. But I'll give them that it didn't have the same traction 10 years ago. It was much harder for you, alone. So from zero, it grew to 50 million last year, about 200 this year, and should further grow to reach 1 billion euros by 2030. Let's pause on that figure for a moment, because in that same document, Veolia also evaluates the size of that PFAS removal segment to weight 3 billion dollars by 2030. So this means that they intend to catch one third of the market. If it was Coca-Cola saying there's a new soda segment in the market and they intend to get a third of it, one would shrug his shoulders and say, yeah, why not? After all, soda is an oligopolistic market where Coca-Cola and PepsiCo hold 77% of the market. But here, that's a huge ambition. The water tech market, by Veolia's own estimates, represents 220 billion euros, of which Veolia is the market leader with 4.7 billion euros, which makes for a slightly over 2% market share. So a company that leads the scattered pack with a 2% market share ambitions to grab one third of a new cake that's just set on the table. How realistic is that? Well, first, I think Veolia may underestimate the size of the PFAS opportunity. As Estelle Brakenhoff recalled during the Q&A session, that estimate is even one that's taken to court right now in the US, as water supply organizations' representatives have filed lawsuits against the EPA, partially because they believe the investment it will trigger is quite larger. But even that set aside, and assuming the EPA is somewhat right, the US alone will at least represent an about $2.5 billion yearly PFAS market by the end of the decade. Meanwhile, and again, as Estelle Brakenhoff recalled, we're not only talking about the US, it's US, Australia, Europe. So as a rough guesstimate, we might take in that Europe and Australia together might weight somewhat the same as the US, which would double our base figure to $5 billion, to which you can add the other types of micropollutant removal, the endocrine disruptors, pharmaceutical residues, and other microplastics. Bottom line, the cake is probably larger than Veolia's $3 billion estimate, and carving out a $1 billion niche appears proportionally more realistic. But still, it's not a given at all. So what makes Veolia CEO so confident? Well, 
Let's listen to her. We're not only talking about removing PFAS from water. We're talking about removing PFAS from water, but removing PFAS from soil, from polluted site. And therefore, the customers will be subject to different type of legislation. The first contract we've won in Australia was because they wanted to decontaminate their site. We have many and a variety of customers uh, from Airbase, Air Force, Airport, industrial sites and we do already have order books in the municipal water. We're not relying only on one legislation in one country. It's really broader than that. So more playgrounds, but also more opportunities for Veolia to leverage their unique edge in that emerging field, the size of their technology portfolio. There is not yet a single killer PFAS technology and there will probably never be. But if we look at the ones which are running in front of the peloton, Veolia has got solid arguments. In Activated Carbon, they have their Active Low Carb product line for ion exchange, they can leverage the Whittier brand. And in reverse osmosis or nanofiltration, they already had the Legacy G water membranes, which they enriched with the former Lanxess portfolio in 2021. Now where I would see a potential for Veolia to run an, how did they call it? Accretive m and move? It's on the second row of that opportunity list, namely not PFAS removal, but PFAS destruction. There, yes, Veolia has a bit of advanced oxidation processes in-house, but not the type that would be the best fit in PFAS elimination. So if I had to bet on a tuck-in move, I really learned new English words today, I would watch that electrochemical oxidation field. Sounds like a good culture match, and it would serve Veolia well in its high-end industrial PFAS applications. To wrap it up, Veolia is betting strongly on the PFAS slash micropollutant opportunities, so strongly that they used this deep dive event to launch a new offer beyond PFAS, which encapsulates all they can offer in this field. I liked the tagline, what's beyond PFAS, peace of mind. Nice alliteration around the P, which makes it memorable. I'll go faster over the four other priority offers. Wastewater reuse, nicely presented by my podcast alumni, Glenn Visevich. Glenn, did I pronounce your surname correctly? You did a great job. I did? You sure? You just, you're not just saying that to make me happy? No comment. I thought so as well. Would you like to say it correctly so everyone knows? Vicevich. Now we all know. Which is really in line with the historic Xenon approach, so nothing revolutionary new but it was the right thing to do back then, so it's certainly still the right thing to do today. Then we have Ultra Pure Water for Pharma and Microelectronics, which follows the hot market created by the trend of reshoring those industries in Europe and the US. Then also Sustainable Desalination, driven by ever-increasing concerns of water scarcity and continued investment in the Middle East, and the always attractive recovery of strategic metals and salts, at least attractive for a water nerd like me, who loves to see water tech recovering the periodic table of elements from a waste with a stream. In conclusion, here are my take-home messages from this Veolia conference. First, the leader is not just happy with that leader's seat, they actively want to keep growing it. To do so, they target water tech as a section of their business that offers at the same time nice margins, 15 to 20 percent according to yesterday's deep dive, and sizable growth prospects. Second, they intend to fuel that growth by repurposing their sizable technology portfolio for new challenges on one hand, but also keep planting new seeds. That's one that may fly under the radar at first sight, given the limited share of their turnover large water groups typically invest in R&D, as Paul O'Callaghan reports in his book. I did quick maths and I'd say that Veolia invests less than 1% of its yearly turnover in R&D and consistently so over the past decades. But that less than 1% seems to still be quite effective. We already have more than 4,000 patents existence, but as interestingly, we are the number one company in Europe in patent registration. We are constantly moving to try to get to the next stage, the new, next frontier, to improve our performance. And that's important because in the segments where Veolia wants to double down with its priority offers, it's facing quite innovative and agile players such as Gradient in microelectronics or Saltworks in the recovery of strategic metals and its fellow water tech giants like Xylem, Veralto or at a different size again Aquatech or Skion are not resting on their laurels. Interestingly as well, and that's my third point in this wrap-up, history is a cycle. Within its merger with Suez, Veolia had to let go its mobile water services division to SOAR two years ago in a commitment to address European Commission's competition concerns. Well, guess who's planning to invest 330 million euros by 2027 in mobile fleet units? Of course, Veolia. Modularity, adaptability, intermittent service approaches, all of those are fully in line with the company's 
75% industrial customer base, so mobile and distributed rapidly sound like a no-brainer. And because those three were my kind of serious feedback in this wrap-up, I have a subjective additional one. I've regularly discussed how the water tech ecosystem tends to forget half of the talent pool when women only represent about 70% of the workforce. So I couldn't help but notice that the four first speakers in this deep dive event were women. I don't believe it changes anything about if it was interesting or not, if it was right or wrong or anything the like, but you can't be what you can't see. And as I discussed with another panel of incredible women at the recent Rethinking Water conference in New York, we'll need role models to move the needle. And God knows the US water infrastructure will need to move the needle. If you wonder why, go check this video and I'll see you next time.